Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, as with many uh, capabilities of AWS, there's choices that you can make when you decide to move a workload into AWS. And one of those choices is, you know, what's the level of abstraction that I want in the services that I consume from AWS? You can do things and deploy software and products on EC2 and full operating systems, get full control and customizability of those. We also have a class of services that for this discussion today we call managed services. And these are services where servers are still there. They're still a, a concern. They're still exposed to you in some capability in order for you to operate with that service. For example, you might size that service, scale it out, scale it in. And with these managed classes of services, you typically do that you know, with servers in mind. And then there's a class of services that we're calling serverless services. And that's where this, this notion of servers and containers is completely removed from the, the consumption of those services and the interaction with those services. You never have to be concerned with them to scale in or scale out as an example. So the name serverless to us at AWS means no servers or containers to manage. Both of those environments, although great for a lot of workloads and use cases, have nuances, right? There's things specific to servers and to containers that you always have to manage. And you don't have to worry about those things in the serverless world. Serverless also means high availability. All of the services we're going to be talking about today in our patterns span the entire AWS region. They're regional services. So they automatically take advantage of all the availability zones inside each of those regions for high availability. Serverless applications also inherently scale. And that is maybe the most important of these because it's really hard to implement horizontal scale when you're working with servers. Very difficult to do. So, uh, serverless, as your requests or events increase coming into your application, serverless will handle the scale for you on the back end. As the requests die back down, serverless will automatically scale that back down. And if you don't have any requests coming in, then that means uh, your back end is completely idle. You never pay for anything with serverless in those situations. So those are really important tenets that you can apply to all of these patterns we're going to be talking about today. Now we need to talk about Lambda functions a little bit. I want to first explain the execution life cycle of a Lambda function. Uh, there's two types of invocations, cold and warm, cold start and warm start. A cold start is the first time you invoke a Lambda function. It's going to download the code that you've uploaded into the service, create a container for those, start the runtime, copy all of your package, everything you've packaged up into that container, basically get it ready to run and start executing some initialization code. A warm start means that it just invokes at the entry point the handler function that you define when you create the, the, uh, the Lambda function. So a cold start will happen the first time. Subsequent invocations will just be a warm start. But eventually, Lambda may take that container back and reclaim that, those resources for other customers and other workloads. And if that happens, the next time you invoke your Lambda function, you go through that cold start process again. So it becomes really important to talk about the cold start and to talk about you know, how you can improve that and make it uh, as fast as possible. So that's where we have the, the tuning knob for Lambda, which is the memory tuning knob. Whenever you configure a Lambda function, you have one dial to dial up or dial down, and that's memory. But what a lot of people don't realize is that dial also affects CPU and network bandwidth. So if you need more memory, great, you dial that knob. But also if you need more CPU, if it's a compute intensive uh, code or application that's running inside the Lambda functions, or if you need more networking bandwidth, maybe you're interacting with S3 to download your code as an example, or backend systems, you know, the, the networking there as well uh, will, will increase as you increase your memory down. And this is important because a lot of times we see customers save money by turning that dial up. If your Lambda function, you know, don't just start with the smallest 128 megs and say, well, it's going to be the least expensive, that's my primary driver. You know, sometimes turning that up alleviates bottlenecks and makes your entire Lambda function execute quicker. We see that happen quite a bit. To help you size your Lambda functions appropriately, check out a project like this. This one was actually created by one of our colleagues in Italy on GitHub, free to use. It uses AWS step functions. You can specify many different sizes of that memory knob and see what the results are, how long they take to execute, and find the most optimal size and calculate your costs. Some other best practices around Lambda specifically, the smaller your package size that you upload, the faster it's going to be, number one. Right? You can use technologies like Minify where applicable. If you're writing your Lambda functions in Java or .NET, 
Those SDKs from AWS are modular. So you can just include the pieces of those SDKs or the modules that you need with your Lambda function, and that's really nice. Specifically around Java and concern around Java cold start times, there's a few, also, there's a, a few best practices there as well. First of all, how you package the, the Lambda function when you upload it to the service uh, can impact the, the cold start times and the performance. There's two ways to do it with Java. One is you can have a single jar file with all your classes, but that can result in a lot of individual class files inside of a single jar, which can be inefficient to work with. A better approach is to take your dependency jars, put them in a lib directory as an example, and then zip it up and upload it to the Lambda service. Also, some older Java frameworks like Spring and Spring Boot, they do a lot of uh, dependency injection at runtime by default. And that's just not friendly for Lambda environments. You know, it increases your cold start time. So where possible, try to favor simpler, smaller, more agile frameworks that do the same thing for you, like Dagger 2 in this case. And if you're doing any uh, Java data binding, like maybe converting a plain old Java object into JSON, you know, leverage some of the smaller and simpler frameworks for that as well, like Jackson Jr. Lambda also has support for environment variables. These allow you to change configurations for your Lambda function. It allows you to change a configuration which affects how your code runs, right? So you can change these variables, these are configuration parameters, then your code executes differently because it references those, those variables. You can also store secrets inside of your environment variables in Lambda, and that's really useful for low latency application needs. You can also store secrets in AWS and AWS Secrets Manager, and that's an absolutely great place to store your secrets. It's outside of Lambda, so a lot of different services will be able to leverage those secrets. But if you need the lowest latency access to secrets, maybe to downstream databases or something like that, use environment variables. Now, you're also going to need some tooling around your Lambda functions. You're going to need to handle or be able to promote your code and deploy new versions safely. You're going to need to be able to enable developer scenarios for local testing and promotions into AWS. Developers still work locally and, and code locally on a laptop, so you have to enable that. And probably most importantly, you need to be able to define your serverless applications as a single versionable entity that you can deliver through your delivery and development pipelines. And that's where serverless application model, or SAM, comes into play. Uh, this is two things. It's a template specification, so you can define all your serverless components in a much abbreviated way in the events that trigger all your Lambda functions. And it's also a CLI that lets you do the local testing and debug and then promotions into AWS. It also has support for things like global configurations. So, you know, you don't have to define every attribute of every Lambda function for every Lambda function. You know, you can define them globally. You know, what's my runtime? You know, what's any attribute associated? What are my environment variables? Whatever the case may be, and do that globally with your APIs or Lambda functions so that all the other resources can use those. And the team's been hard at work adding new features. We support API gateway authorizers now, which we'll talk about in an upcoming slide. Single line course configuration, you know, where was that a few years ago? Really easy to do with, with serverless application model. And uh, managed policies, much like IAM has had managed policies for IAM to give you really easy ways to set up restrictive access for your Lambda functions. You can define that now in, in SAM as well. Probably the easiest way for developers to take advantage of SAM is through Cloud9. This is our browser-based IDE, and it support, supports multiple users working on the same project at the same time. So it's a collaborative IDE. You can author your SAM templates from here and validate them. You can upload your code into a Git repository and begin deploying that through your delivery pipeline. Now, in the AWS world, we have a code repository that's private called CodeCommit. And we also have a suite of code services here that will take your code through a pipeline, perform the build steps, integrate any third-party testing that you need, and ultimately deploy that, right? And you can leverage CloudFormation, which SAM does, as well as CodeDeploy to do your deployments. And, you know, you can, you're free to go into those individual consoles and string all of that together, but it's actually a lot easier now with CodeStar. So CodeStar is a console that you can go into that's a wrapper around all of these deployment uh, and development pipeline services. And uh, you can go in and create a new project, say, hey, I want to create a serverless uh, web app as an example, 
choose your runtime, and it will actually create all of the things in these services that it needs, string them all together according to our best practices. It'll even spin up a Cloud9 IDE for you, ready to go with a SAM template that you can use to start uh, getting, to, to get started. So really, really nice and easy way to get going with some of this stuff. Lambda also supports traffic shifting or safe deployments through the serverless application model. So in your SAM templates, you can specify this auto-publish alias line, and when you upload new code to an existing Lambda function, it will detect that, and it will allow you to specify a traffic shifting policy. You've got nine of those listed here. This is actually handled by code deploy under the covers. So you can do canary deployments. You can say, hey, I just want 10% of my traffic to go to that new version, and I want to associate up to 10 CloudWatch alarms with that. And if any of those alarms fire, I'm going to re revert back to the old version. There's also linear deployments where you can go up by 10% every so, every so often, according to every time interval that you see there. And if you need more flexibility with this deployment, then we have a blog post out there that really uses step functions to do very similar things. It just gives you more customizability. Instead of those nine predefined deployment types, you can do whatever you want to here. Okay? So this is a good blog that has some, a template to get you started. Okay, so that's a little bit about the background, right? That's what is serverless, Lambda functions, some optimization for those, and some tooling around those Lambda functions. Now we're gonna start with the first pattern, which is our web application pattern. This is what the web application pattern looks like. At the top, you have static content stored in an S3 bucket that's front-ended with a CloudFront distribution, and then dynamic requests funnel down along the bottom to API Gateway that provides a REST endpoint for your APIs. And typically, the most common pattern is to have a Lambda function behind those REST endpoints, which in turn can contact some downstream service. In this case, DynamoDB, but it could be other back-end services as well, like Aurora Serverless. DynamoDB's released a lot of great features in 2018. It's been a busy year for them. Backup and restore, point-in-time recovery to go back in case errors uh, occurred so you can recover from those errors. Uh, and also adaptive capacity. Uh, it hasn't really been touted very much, but it used to be with DynamoDB, you'd get hot partitions, and you could consume all the bandwidth of one partition very easily. But now DynamoDB will borrow throughput and bandwidth from some of the other unused partitions so that the hot partition can continue to, to execute. And then you have Cognito for sign up and sign in capabilities and for federation. So if you're in a corporate environment, if you have Active Directory, Federation Services, or some other identity provider, you can build these applications according to this pattern, and you can federate with your existing identity providers. Custom Inc. uses this exact pattern. Any of you guys familiar with Custom Inc. out there? It's a really cool site. You can go upload clip art. Uh, they make t-shirts and apparel for family events. I'm sure you've seen the family reunion t-shirts that people wear sometimes. You know, great use case for Custom Inc. But they actually went from a legacy environment based on EC2. They had problems with scaling. They had problems during high peak usage. And specifically, their most problematic area of their website was the clip art upload manipulation portion. So they moved that over to serverless with API Gateway and Lambda, and they've been able to realize up to 90% savings and uh, a much more reliable environment. Okay, now back to this pattern. I wanna drill into API Gateway a little bit because there's a lot of choices around API Gateway specifically with this pattern. There are three types of API Gateway APIs that you can create in AWS. The first one and the one that's been around the longest is an edge optimized API. And that just means the API actually exists at our CloudFront locations. And the API Gateway team creates a CloudFront distribution for any API you spin up of this type, but that distribution is not exposed to you at all. You can't enable caching on that. You can't take advantage of many of the cloud, CloudFront features. Um, so fortunately, you don't pay for it, but it's, it's there, but you, you're unable to take advantage of it. So you might have a need to put a CloudFront distribution in front of your API, in this pattern, sharing your CloudFront distribution uh, for both the S3 content and your, your API. Now this introduces some, some patterns. We used to recommend this for WAF. You know, if you wanted to put AWS WAF in front of your API, you could do that at a CloudFront layer. But it also introduces now Lambda at Edge into the picture. Lambda at Edge are Lambda functions that run at our Edge locations. And you can do some really creative things with this, a lot of use cases. For example, 
You can actually create and customize content and experiences for your users without ever changing your backend. You can do all of that stuff at the edge because these Lambda at Edge functions can now make network calls into other AWS services. You can also do things like URL re rewriting pretty URLs to help with search engine optimization. You can validate authorization tokens when they come in at the edge. Uh, a lot of great scenarios to take advantage of with Lambda at Edge. And we have blueprints for most of these. So when you go into the Lambda console and you create a function, you'll see at the top, you can search through blueprints, starting points for your Lambda functions. And if you just search through CloudFront, the word CloudFront, you'll see all of these blueprints come up and you can start from them for all of these different use cases. There's also a serverless application repository I'll just quickly mention uh, that's at that same location when you create a Lambda function. And these are entire serverless applications that you can start from that people share based on SAM templates. So check that out as well. I think that's very useful. The second type of API uh, gateway API is a regional API. And we came out with this after edge optimized APIs to help with regional failover disaster recovery scenarios. So you build out your serverless environment according to the pattern we talked about in one region. Now you can do that in a second region and you can share the same TLS certificate. So you can put both of those behind the same host name that's maybe managed and, and routed through Route 53 as you see in this example. So Route 53 could do 0, 100 waitings, you know, send all your traffic to one region and then in the case of a failover, you know, send your traffic to another region. Or you could have both of them active at the same time. And you can use DynamoDB global tables in the back end to move your rights, keep your rights in sync between your uh, DynamoDB tables in both of those regions. You can still put CloudFront distributions in front of each of these regional APIs, so that's still a valid pattern. In this particular case, I'm still leveraging Route 53 to do the routing between those two now CloudFront endpoints, okay? But you can move to a single CloudFront distribution as well with Lambda at Edge and move the logic of routing to Lambda at Edge. So you can maybe take the country, the origin, location of that incoming request and use that to route to the specific endpoint that you'd like or other logic. So the nice thing is you have the flexibility with Lambda at Edge to do that. And then the third type of API type with API Gateway is a private API. And this just means it's inside the VPC. It's not exposed at all to the public network or the public side of our data centers. Systems and, and in instances in, inside your VPC can contact that API directly. And we've also enabled scenarios through AWS Direct Connect for private APIs as well. So if you have Direct Connect at, a, at an on-premises location, you can use that to get to that private API endpoint as well. Okay, let's talk about security of serverless web applications. Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with traditional web applications that are tiered according to a web layer and a logic layer and a data layer. And you have firewalls between those tiers. That's traditionally how you handled security. It's different with serverless. There's different security features. Every one of the services we're talking about has their own security features that you can implement that give you multiple layers of protection. S3 has bucket policies. These are resource policies that control who can access that bucket. You could whitelist, blacklist IPs or VPCs, for example. CloudFront has origin access identity to pr prevent anybody except CloudFront from getting to that S3 bucket and has the ability to leverage signed cookies and signed URLs for requests coming in. And it provides DDoS protection, which probably by itself is enough region, reason to, to put a CloudFront distribution in front of your application. Down at the bottom on the API Gateway side, there's authorizers for every single method in API that, that your clients may call. So at, at a method level, you can make sure that people are authorized, and we'll talk about some of the strategies to do that. There's also this notion now of resource policies at the API Gateway and Lambda service level. This is new. Resource policies is something AWS has done for quite a while. We've had bucket policies on S3 for many years, and SQS has had resource policies for many years, and many other services. And just in 2018, we announced the support for Lambda and API Gateway. So now you can specify uh, principles other than identities to get access to those resources. For example, other VPCs, or other AWS accounts, or IP addresses, something other than identities. And this enables cross-account scenarios between Lambda and API Gateway. For example, I can author functions in a central location. My Lambda functions can be in a central AWS account. 
And then I can have many APIs across many teams and API gateway APIs that leverage those Lambda functions in the other account. I can also centralize my authorizers. Your security team can build out the logic inside the authorizers and then all of the APIs scattered across all your AWS API gateway accounts can leverage that. And then DynamoDB also has a few new security features this year. Encryption at rest, hey, big round of applause for that one, and private VPC endpoints. Now let's talk a little bit about Cognito and how it can be leveraged to promote federation uh, and sign in and authorization for uh, your serverless web application. So there's two sides to Cognito. There's Cognito identity pools and Cognito user pools. The main job of Cognito identity pools is to honor an authentication token from a down, uh, an upstream identity provider and convert that or exchange that for IAM credentials. So you can see in this diagram, I've got scenario A at the top in green and B in the middle in yellow. Those are both authorized API gateway methods with IAM authorization, okay? So I'm allowing people to call these APIs through IAM authorization. So in, in scenario A, maybe I'm authenticating to Facebook. I get a token from Facebook or some other identity provider. I get a token from that provider. I exchange that for IAM credentials. And as long as my IAM credentials have the privileges, I'll be able to execute the method or the resource inside of the API gateway API. Scenario B is the same way. It's, it's instead of using some identity provider out there that Cognito Identity Pool supports, it's using Cognito User Pools. Cognito User Pools also provides a token. I exchange that token for IAM credentials and I get authorized for that resource. But that particular scenario, scenario B here, is really useful for leveraging group memberships as well inside of Cognito User Pools. So you can say things like, if you're a member of this group, then I get access to this API. And then the third way to handle authorization with Cognito is just directly validating the web tokens that Cognito User Pools provides. So in this case, we're not using IAM authorization. We're using a specific Cognito User Pools authorizer. We take the token directly from Cognito User Pools and API Gateway validates that for us. Um, so that's probably the lowest latency way to perform authorization. Now, if you wanna go beyond that for authorization, you can actually create your own custom authorizers and they're called Lambda authorizers. There's two types. The token puts a, some sort of identity token uh, in the, the header, the authorization header, the request, and validates that. And then you can add your own custom logic there. And then there's a request authorization type, which can use any of the headers or query strings, paths or stage variables, and you can create your own logic to authorize. And that's really great for scenarios where you may want to have different authorization schemes for different stages of your web application. Maybe in dev test, I authorize one way, but in production, I authorize a different way. A lot of customers are looking at alternatives to REST APIs when it comes to creating really highly dynamic and responsive web and mobile applications. And that's where GraphQL comes into play. So this is also a part of serverless web applications now at AWS. I wanna cover GraphQL a little bit uh, and then I'll talk about how we implement that at AWS. Let's imagine you had a, an API that was for blog posts, thousands of blog posts. And I wanted to create an application that listed all of those blog posts so I could choose one and get more details about it. So with the REST API, I might make a call to my endpoint and say, hey, give me all the blog posts. As a client, I really just take whatever the back end gives me. It's gonna give me a list of those blog posts, but it might give me a lot of details about those blog posts that I just don't need. All I need is the title, okay? GraphQL enables that scenario. It enables clients to specify just the information that they want. So I can actually make a request and say, just give me the title, even though the back end is set up to provide a JSON document with a lot of different attributes related to the blog post. And then I click on a blog post and I wanna be able to view details about that, like maybe the author, people, comments that, that readers have left about that blog post. In the rest world, that might involve multiple round trips to back ends, to endpoints. I might go in and get the comments endpoint and get all the comments, and then I go get the biographies about the authors and their names, and those are multiple round trips to my REST endpoint. But with GraphQL, I have one endpoint for all my backend data sources. So I make one call and request that information and get it back. So ultimately, you're left with a lot of network efficiencies by using GraphQL. Facebook created this. They open sourced it in 2015, and they create it because of the responsiveness they needed in their applications. And it's really gaining a lot of popularity. It also supports offline modes. 
and it supports multiple transports, not just HTTP, but also MQTT over WebSockets. And that's great for subscribing to data. You can subscribe to, to MQTT topics with this. So if somebody adds a new blog post in my scenario, my application would immediately reflect that change as soon as it gets added. Now we implement GraphQL at AWS with AppSync. Okay, so check out AWS AppSync. It provides several different resolvers for backend data sources, DynamoDB tables, legacy applications. Uh, it supports federation with Cognito. There's even an HTTP resolver which you can use to wrap REST APIs if you want to do that. Okay, so that's it for the web application pattern. Let's talk about some stream processing uh, and some patterns related to that. For this section, we're gonna focus primarily on the Kinesis family of services. There are four services today with Kinesis. It may change later this week, I don't know, but for now there's four. The first is video streams. We're not gonna spend too much time on that, but that's allowing you to put videos and time encoded data like audio, radar, or LIDAR data in a stream. And then you can create computer vision or machine learning applications from that time series data. My tree will talk about recognition video, Amazon recognition video, and how that can work with Kinesis video streams to do facial recognition of video streams. We're gonna focus primarily on data streams, data firehose, and data analytics. Now the easiest way, I think, to ingest data into AWS and deliver it to a location is with Kinesis data firehose. So I wanna start there. In this scenario, you have record producers and clients on the left side of this diagram, and they're riding to the stream at usually a very fast ingest rate. The Kinesis agent is great here as well because if you have log files or text files that are constantly being updated, you can use the Kinesis agent just to forward that information to a stream. So it's really easy to implement. First of all, in the bottom right-hand corner, you see source record backup. That's a checkbox that you can enable to automatically preserve all your original records as they enter the stream. So that's a really easy thing to do, to get backups of everything before they're processed. You can leverage a Lambda function in this pattern to handle some lightweight transformations and enrichments. In this case at the top, maybe looking up some values in DynamoDB and adding that to your data before it gets processed. And the really important thing about Firehose is that it can deliver to these known destinations that you see on the right. S3, Elasticsearch, Redshift. You don't have to write the code to take the data off the stream and put it in the destination. Now, you can also enable this scenario with HTTP clients. So instead of having some of those clients we talked about in the previous slide, you just have browsers out there maybe, and they're sending HTTP posts and puts. They can send that to a CloudFront distribution with Lambda at Edge, and Lambda at Edge can then handle the task of placing that information onto a Kinesis stream so it can be delivered. That's great for clickstream analytics. Some best practices around Kinesis Data Firehose. First of all, you have two envelopes to determine when data is delivered to those destinations. It doesn't happen in real time. It happens when one of these envelopes fills up. So I can specify a buffer size, the amount of data, and a buffer interval, the amount of time. And as soon as one of those envelopes fills up, it's gonna deliver to that destination that I've specified, okay? So the lower you have those envelopes, the, the more often it's gonna deliver. Right? But the higher those envelopes are, the more efficient it's gonna be, the fewer calls it's gonna to make to your Lambda function for enrichment uh, or S3 puts that are gonna be involved. So there's some trade-offs there. Kinesis Firehose can also uh, compress your data before it delivers that to the destination, so that's useful. You might as well take advantage of that where possible. Now, if you need near real-time processing of stream data, then we recommend Kinesis Data Streams and Lambda as a consumer of the data on that data stream. Kinesis data streams is scaled by shard. Each shard has one megabyte of ingest and two megabytes of, of egress bandwidth, okay? And you can assign a lambda function, one lambda function, to process the data on each shard, and only one. Now you can't, actually I'll take that back, you can't have multiple lambda functions process shard, but they'd be totally separate applications, totally separate iterators for different purposes with different logic, but one lambda function per application per shard. What happens is the Lambda service reads the data off those Kinesis streams for you, takes all the data off, and then hands it to your Lambda function in batches. So you need to make sure that the batch size is configured correctly in this case. It's small enough where the, that Lambda function can process it efficiently and return uh, to get more data uh, off of that. But it's, it's also big enough to prevent your data stream from backing up, right? You're getting enough data off so it's not growing faster than your Lambda function can process. 
If that becomes an issue, then we suggest maybe looking at the fan out pattern. So in this pattern, I'm changing the role of the lambda function from the processor of the data on that stream to just a dispatcher. That lambda function is reading off the shard, and what it's doing is it's invoking parallel lambda functions to actually do the processing. And it can do that asynchronously, come back, get more data off the stream, and invoke more lambda functions to process that data, right? You lose ordering when you do this, okay? So that's one caveat to be aware of, but it will improve your latency. So if latency is more important than ordering, this is a great pattern to follow. And then the last component of Kinesis I want to talk about is Kinesis Data Analytics. This gives you real-time insight into the data on your stream as it's flowing in. It gives you a SQL interface to query that data. And you can actually create outputs from these SQL queries and use the outputs to deliver to other streams or Lambda functions like you see here. A Lambda function maybe uh, that's looking for high-valued metrics for whatever is, is on your stream could be delivered to SNS for a notification as an example. And you can also tier these SQL queries together, so the output of one could be the input of the other. Kinesis Data Analytics also has a lot of built-in functions, really advanced functions that can help you get more insight into this data. For example, anomaly detection with random cut forest functions, or the top occurrences of a certain metric, or maybe hot spots in your data. So really advanced functions, very easy to take advantage of out of the box. Here's an example of a SQL statement that's, that we used with uh, Kinesis Data Analytics. So this is a real SQL statement. In blue here, you have kind of some of your boilerplate SQL, uh, your, your select statement. Um, in pink, if that's clear, um, as you can see here, I'm using uh, Kinesis Data Analytics step function, not to be confused with AWS's step function, to group my readings according to a time window. So I'm doing some, some time windowing analysis here and aggregations. So I'm grouping them by 10 minute windows and then I'm doing sums or counts or averages or whatever it is you want to do on that data. And, and that's in, in purple in the middle. One of the customers that leverages these Kinesis data services is Autonomo. Autonomo is in the connected car business and they're really responsible and, and have taken a, a viewpoint of creating a, an exchange of connected car data that's safe and anonymized. They get data sources from multiple car manufacturers and, and other companies, and they anonymize that and allow people to make applications from this data. This is location information about cars, traffic patterns, parking locations. I mean, there's a lot of different use cases in this space, but they use Kinesis data streams, fire hose, as well as analytics uh, to, to enable these types of scenarios. A lot of volume as well, 200 million events per day, up to 500,000 million events per second at peak. And then lastly, I just want to leave you with a slide that might help you choose the correct messaging platforms for your applications. We've been very focused on Kinesis uh, in this section, obviously, but there are other choices, even in the serverless realm. Um, they have various attributes. Message ordering, for example, um, with Kinesis data streams happens within a shard. You also might have caught last week we made an announcement with HTTP2 support between Lambda and Kinesis data streams. It's not something I talked about in the previous slide, but now you can able push scenarios into your Lambda functions from the data on your Kinesis data streams with this new feature. It'll keep a connection open for up to five minutes, and as new data arrives on your stream, that will be pushed versus the Lambda service having to pull data and hand it back to your functions in batches. Okay, so that concludes my section on web application patterns and streaming patterns. I'm now going to turn it over to my trade to talk about data lake pattern. Thank you. Thank you, Drew. So I'll take you through the remaining two patterns. I'll start with first talking about how you can collect, store, organize, as well as analyze all your organization's data in the data lake pattern. And I'll conclude with how you can bring the power of machine learning to your applications to make them smarter, to be able to serve your customers better. So let's start first with the data lake. The holiday season is just about upon us, so we just had Black Friday and we had Cyber Monday yesterday. So I thought it would be appropriate to look at an e-commerce example and build that through our use case. So if you're running an e-commerce site and you're responsible for analytics, you know that you'll be getting data from a variety of different sources. That could be click streams on your website, 
That could be data from your supply chain, your inventory management. That could also be reviews and social media posts by your customers uh, who are describing their experiences on your website. That could be pretty unstructured. So all that data is valuable to your organization. And it's important for you to be able to collect that and store it as inexpensively as possible so that you can use tools and techniques to analyze that so you can improve your operations, business insights to make your efficiencies better, and serve your customers ultimately better. So as you think about that, one of the key attributes is to make sure that your compute is independent and decoupled from your storage. So you can scale those independently and pay for those as well independently. You also want to make sure that you store all your data in its raw and unprocessed form in an open format. And that's important because of two reasons. One is, though you might have an idea of the questions you might want to ask of that data today, you don't know what you might need to ask of that data tomorrow. You might have completely different questions. And having the raw data makes it possible for you to answer that. Likewise, you might know what tools you want to use today, but they might be tools that come out in the future that you might want to deploy and use with the same data. So you want to keep that data in an open format so that you can use techniques like schema on read, where you don't define the schema when you write the data, but you define it on the fly when you read it with the new tools that come along. So that, in a sense, are some attributes of a data lake. So how do we implement a data lake in the serverless world? It really starts first with S3 as the core for some really good reasons that we shall go into in a minute. And we layer services around that for different functionality. So we start first with ingest. And Drew talked about how you can use streaming services from the Kinesis family to stream your data into your data lake. But what if you have a fleet of sensors, devices, IoT, se systems that are sensing data and sending you measurements? You can use AWS IoT to effectively collect that data and ingest that into your data lake. What if you have a different scenario? You have systems that send you data using legacy protocols like SFTP. So I'm happy to announce that we had a service announced just on Monday, which is called AWS Transfer for SFTP. This is a fully managed service that lets you set up an SFTP endpoint, point that to an S3 bucket as your backend, and collect your data using SFTP from your legacy apps. You can use SSH keys for authentication, or you can also connect up to your existing identity stores like Active Directory for authenticating your users. So great ways for you to get your data into S3 efficiently and quickly. Once you have your data in the data lake, it's important to let your users be able to find it and to also be able to identify elements of interest to them. And so that's search and catalog. We shall see patterns for that soon. And you also want to give your users a variety of choices in terms of the tools they want to use to analyze and process that. We'll look at a couple of examples here. And also, not to forget to mention, there are lots of server-based choices which work really well with S3 as a data lake as well, such as EMR. We talked about how that data is really valuable to your organization, so it's important to be able to protect that data. So there are a lot of security features that you might want to take advantage of. The first problem you want to solve is to make sure that your users that are allowed to see the data are actually have a business need to do so. So you want to have permissions and controls and you can do that using identity-based policies in IAM, or you can use that, do that based on resource-based policies using S3 buckets and S3 bucket policies and ACLs. So take advantage of that to define policies like financial data can only be accessed by the finance group or the finance role. Once you have your data in the data lake, you might be required to encrypt that at rest. And the easiest way to do that is to use encryption server-side with keys stored in KMS. You get a complete list of audit of who accessed the data and when they used the decrypt operations to see that data. It's also important to enable what's called data event logging, which is a S3 feature, which now generates cloud trail events so that you can audit all the accesses of data in your data lake and use that to identify if your controls that you set up are working as expected. Almost by definition, a data lake is going to have different types of data. So you might want to answer questions like, does that data have personally identifiable, inform identifiable information? Does it have credit card numbers? Does it, does it have social security numbers? Do I know what's in my data lake? So to help you answer that question, you might want to consider enabling Amazon Macy, which is a service that crawls your data lake 
and identifies indicators of this type of sensitive information, and it highlights that to you in a dashboard. So you can see which elements of data have sensitive information of which types, and you can take now actions to protect that appropriately. You might want to perhaps delete some of that to comply with your laws or encrypt that with different techniques. Macy also models user behavior. So it learns what is normal for your organization. What do your users normally do? And when it notices suspicious behavior, so a user downloads an entire corpus of data, whereas in normal practice, they download very small parts of that every day, that might be an indicator of a rogue user or a program that's trying to exfiltrate data. You can be alerted of that, and again, you can take actions to prevent that data loss. Now that you have your results from your data lake, after your analysis, you might want to now share that with your end users, and you can do that using the web or microservices patterns, API Gateway, Cognito, that Drew talked about in pattern one. So now let's answer the question, why is S3 a great foundation for a data lake? It really starts with that first principle, which is decoupling storage from compute. You don't have to run a compute cluster just in order to store data. Compare that with if you were storing your data in a Hadoop cluster on HDFS, you do need a cluster running 24-7, whether you analyze that or not, just for the storage. So with S3, you just pay for storage, and you can use multiple analytics techniques, as we shall see, to analyze that data. Those two are not coupled. You can pay for that independently and scale them independently. Coming to scale, S3 can scale virtually unlimited in terms of the number of objects, the volume, the size, as well as bandwidth. As you throw as much parallel readers at S3, and it will scale according to that. Some interesting features that are also perhaps less known is S3 Select, for example. So this is a feature that lets you push down your SQL query down to the S3 layer and say, don't give me the entire object S3, just give me the rows and columns that match the SQL query that I just gave you. Great way for you to reduce the amount of data that you read from your data lake and to make it very optimal in terms of how you get your data back. You can also protect your data lake much better using two features here. The first is object tagging. You can add tags to your objects, and you can use those tags in policies. Again, going back to the finance example, you can have objects which are tagged with owner equals finance, and you can have IAM policies that say that groups of users belonging to the finance role can access data which is tagged with owner equals finance and no one else. So it's a great way for you to organize and manage accesses to your data. Another great feature that we announced about two weeks ago lets you further protect your resources in the data lake. It's called block public access. This is an account level set of properties that will allow you to override bucket policies and object ACLs. So even if someone made a mistake at the bucket level or at the object level and made an object public, block public access will override that and ensure that your objects are always private and your data lake stays protected. So it avoids mistakes happening. So now we have your data in your data lake. You want to allow your data analysts and users of that data to quickly find the data elements and data sets of interest to them. You want to allow them, for example, we've collected data about purchases, products, reviews, perhaps inventory. Those are different data sets, and you want to let your users find those data sets using keywords like that, as well as look up information like, I want inventory from a particular month in 2018, rather than going to S3 and listing large lists of objects and trying to find those elements of interest, you want to index that and let them query a more optimized system. So that is where you want to put your data into Elasticsearch for free text or keyword-based searches, and DynamoDB for index-based lookups. And you can do that using the pattern here. Objects arrive in S3. Those can trigger a Lambda function. The function pulls out metadata and writes that into DynamoDB or updates a search index in Elasticsearch. This is a well-established pattern, and it actually is part of the Data Lake solution, the link below. This is a quick start that you can deploy into your account and get this type of pattern and much more deployed in a few minutes. Now you have your data in your data lake. You want to let your users actually be able to query that. And in, order, in order to do that, you need a metadata index or a metadata catalog, which contains information about data formats, other files JSON, CSV, or parquet, what are the column types and what are the column data types, right? Are they strings, are they integers, things like that. 
And that is effectively stored in a service called Glue, which has a feature called a Glue catalog. And a Glue catalog is Hive Metastore compatible, so you can use a variety of tools to query that. But in order to populate that catalog, you might want to use crawlers, which are features of Glue, which you deploy and unleash on your data lake. The crawlers will look at the data files that are in your data lake, identify the file types, CSV, JSON, Parquet. It will extract field information from those files, essentially the columns and the data types, and populate that into your Glue catalog. If your file data changes in the future, you can rerun your crawlers, and the crawlers will update, update your catalog based on the new data. Once you have your data in the catalog, you can deploy tools like Athena, which is a serverless query service, or Amazon Redshift Spectrum, which is a feature of Redshift, to query the data from the Glue metadata catalog and get you the results. EMR, which is a server-based service, also supports the same catalog, so you can query the data using multiple different methods. Another feature to call out is that the data catalog has resource level policies, which means that you can control access to individual tables in the Glue catalog, again, deciding that the finance team can query tables related to finance data, but no one else, for example. We talked about analysis and how you want to essentially give your users the widest array of choices. So we have S3 Select, QuickSight, which is a visualization service, as well as Athena and Lambda, we shall see in a minute. But I also want to call out machine learning. You might want to enable your users to do predictive analytics. And SageMaker is a great way to do that. It lets your users build, train, based on the data in your data lake, as well as host machine learning models. And those models can also be exported and deployed into EC2 instances as you wish. Oftentimes, you want to do something that's called, typically called extract transform load. So you have data in your data lake, you need to transform it in different ways and load it into a destination system like Redshift. You can do that very easily with another feature of Glue called the Glue ETL. Glue can provide you and auto-generate Spark code for you that you can customize. And then once you have that code, you can submit that to Glue and you can use the Glue's job execution framework to run that at scale on Glue's clusters, completely serverless, and perform that transformation and load that data into your destination system. What if your users don't want to actually run a cluster, but they want to answer quick questions? They want uh, something that is exploratory or ad hoc analysis. They just want to run a SQL query and get the results quickly without the overhead of having to run a cluster 24-7 or wait for that cluster to spin up. A great fit for that use case is Athena. It's a serverless query service. It starts by you just writing a SQL in the Presto dialect, submitting that to Athena, and Athena will run that query on a cluster of servers behind the scenes and get the results back to you in S3. It can be really fast. As you can see here, a very simple example that trawled through about 160 gigs of data. It, Athena did so at the rate of about four gigabytes per second. I also want to highlight the cost. Athena charges you based on the amount of data scanned, and this query just cost 85 cents. And if this is all the query you ever run, this is all you ever pay, right? You don't have to pay for a cluster running 24-7 just to answer this particular ad hoc query. A few best practices with Athena. Since Athena charges you based on the amount of data scanned, if you reduce that, you reduce your cost, as well as you get your results faster. So three techniques here. The first is partitioning. Create a naming convention, something like this, which lets you scope down your query based on date and month and year, and so that Athena will skip all the other files and other folders effectively in S3 that don't contain data matching your query. It's always a good idea to use columnar formats for two reasons. Columnar formats, many of them support compression, which reduces the amount of data, and Athena can use the columnar data to pull out only those column blocks that your query needs. If you have very wide columns, you don't need to pull the data for all of them. And the third thing that, that Athena can do is look at block statistics, which have information about max, min on those columns, and it'll skip those column blocks which don't have data matching your query criteria. Compression we talked about, but if you're compressing individual files, use a splittable compression so that Athena can still parallelize those queries across a cluster. What if your processing needs are slightly different? You can't represent that easily in SQL. It's custom logic or compute intensive work. Now you can deploy that processing logic, of course, on EC2, server-based, 
Or you can even use a service called AWS Batch to orchestrate that in terms of containers across a fleet of container servers. But what if you want to take advantage of the massively parallel compute available to you through Lambda? You have lots of parallel functions that you can run, and you can take advantage of that using a pattern like this here. Essentially, this is a serverless MapReduce pattern. It starts first with a splitter function, which picks up work from S3, decides the batches and the batches sizes, and it invokes a bunch of parallel Lambda function invocations, up to 1,000 parallel functions with the default limit, and of course, that limit can be increased. Once those functions crunch to the, through the data, and they can now be invoked for up to 15 minutes, so that's a lot of compute time that you have, those functions can write their intermediate results into DynamoDB, which are picked up by a reducer function, and final results go into S3. So you can get a lot of compute out of this. An example of a customer that uses this pattern is Fannie Mae. They need to do a lot of financial modeling, which turns out to be a really compute-intensive process, mathematically compute-intensive, Monte Carlo simulations, essentially. And they take advantage of this pattern to run that at scale, and they found that moving from a server-based approach to a serverless approach made their process four times faster. And they can do a lot of these processing in the time that it used to take the server-based approach to do. If you have Python code, which is doing that numerical compute, you might want to take advantage of PyREN, which is a framework or a project that helps you distribute that massively parallel across Lambda functions. So it takes care of packaging your Python code, as well as the inputs related to that, and pushes that in parallel to the function invocation in Lambda, in parallel. So they benchmarked saying that they could actually get 10 teraflops of compute power from Lambda just with the default 1,000 concurrent function limit. So that's a lot of compute power in your hands. For data-intensive apps, they also benchmarked that they could transfer data in at 60 gigabytes per second using the same 1,000 concurrent Lambda function invocation. So that's very fast as well as a lot of compute. So that's it for Data Lake. Now let's see how you can make your app smarter as a developer using the power of machine learning. So AWS has many services that fit into the machine learning space, and it really is different uh, services targeted at different levels of users. If you're a data scientist, you might be comfortable and you need the power of working at the framework level. So you can customize all the attributes for the framework and work with it at the framework level, like using techniques like TensorFlow or CAFE. And AWS provides optimized EC2 instances for those frameworks to run on. In the middle tier, you have services like SageMaker, which will help you with predefined models as well as custom models and give you a framework for you to build as well as test and build and learn and deploy and host those models on the SageMaker service itself. The top layer is our focus for this talk, which is API-driven services. These are targeted towards developers who don't have a lot of machine learning expertise, but again want to take advantage of models that AWS builds and provides that power in your own hands. You have services that deal with vision, such as recognition image, recognition video. You have services that deal with language processing, such as Poly, which is text to speech, transcribe, which is speech to text, and translate, as the name suggests, can convert between languages, and comprehend, which can make sense of natural language, identify sentiments, keywords, phrases, and topics, as well as chatbots, which will give you the same kind of conversational experience as you might have experienced with the Echo, Amazon, Alexa family of devices. Let's start first with an image processing example. Imagine you have a website, you allow users to submit images, you share that with your friends and family, you might want to search for those images based on keywords and content inside those images. So the process starts with a user uploading that, it ends up in S3, and now we trigger a Lambda function which starts off a step function workflow. This orchestrates multiple APIs, such as recognition, to call to label the images based on content inside the images, to detect moderation labels. Is the content mature content? Should we have it published at all? And things like text. So the end result of all of that is that we have that metadata or information written to DynamoDB as well as Elasticsearch. So when your users come in and say, give me all the images with bicycles in them, they can get that results back really quickly. What if you're required now to extend that to allow your users to upload audio as well as video? So now you have other requirements coming in. You can extend that same application to add video and audio capabilities. 
So you have the same pr properties. But once you have the images and uh, the audio and video, you might want to translate that or transcribe that into different formats. So you can use the service, which is part of the Elemental Media Convert family, to transcribe the video into different formats. You can use recognition video now to analyze that video to extract faces, uh, labels, as well as objects, and store that into Elasticsearch. And you can transcribe the audio part of those videos to get the text. And you can use Comprehend on that to identify sentiment and keywords. So now you have a really good search index that your users can search to find media of interest. So I can put in a search criteria saying, give me all the reInvent videos, and the results will come back based on the transcripts of the videos themselves. And this is actually part of our media analysis solution. Again, a quick start that you can deploy in a few minutes into your account. The next two patterns really have Connect at their core. So Amazon Connect is a fully managed serverless call center solution in the cloud. It lets you create interactive call center applications that do things like IVR and call routing, as well as analytical features, as we shall see in a minute. So imagine that your users are calling a call center, and they're frustrated because they're waiting in queues, because they have common tasks such as rescheduling appointments, and they are waiting to speak to a human agent. You can speed that all up by creating a chat bot for those common use cases. The customer calls the call center. Amazon Connects directs them to a Lex chatbot, which starts conversing with the user to see that what is their next scheduled appointment time, and what are the available times. Once they agree upon an intent, which is the new time, Lex will call a Lambda function to fulfill the intent, which could involve writing to a DynamoDB table and delivering an SMS notification confirming the appointment. Now your users get served really fast, and your agents can focus on the actual important customer experience tasks rather than the common tasks such as rescheduling appointments. We can take call center analytics further. We can use the information provided by Connect to improve our service much further. So Connect provides two streams. The first are called contract trace records, which is information about the call duration, the call time, the agent that picked it up. All that information is streamed via Kinesis streams as well as Firehose into S3. Connect can also provide call recordings, the audio parts, and we can stream that and send that over through Transcribe to get the transcripts in S3. We can send those transcripts through Comprehend to find sentiments and topics. So now you can see that we've added all that call center data to our data lake, and we can use familiar tools like Athena and QuickSight to analyze that to provide insights to improve the service to our customers. So in summary, I'd like to leave you with a quote from Werner Vogels. He said this when we launched Lambda back in 2015. He said, no server is easier to manage than no server. And that remains true today with all the serverless services that we've seen. You don't pay for idle, and you actually scale as you grow, and you also pay as you grow. We've seen how those patterns can apply to web apps. We've seen those apply to streaming, as well as building a data lake, as well as using machine learning algorithms to make your apps smarter. We hope that you can use these patterns in your organizations when you go home. And we'd like to actually hear from you what you will build with serverless. Thank you.